To see the world, things dangerous to come to, to see behind walls, to draw closer, to find each other, and to feel. That is the purpose of life. A quote in one of my favorite movies, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. And the phrase that I repeated to myself as the stinging ice cold air kept me awake and warmed in my lungs as I exhaled into my bandana covering my face. And all I could think about was putting one foot in front of the other. We had been hiking since midnight on our six day trek towards the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro in northeast Tanzania. It felt like the six day version of what we all go through in college. We make our challenging four-year trek towards graduation, but also somehow do incredible things along the way. Today, we get to honor those incredible things and the seniors that have almost reached their summit. But for all of us overachievers, outreachers, and dreamers, the thing we need to remember is not the breathtaking, relieving view from the top, but that beyond mountains, there are more mountains and our journey doesn't end here. Today, we are honored for more than what we have done, but because we are the type of people that will keep trekking. Breaking through barriers and new challenges, and to find those close, unexplainable connections with humans long after we, long after we walk at graduation and boldly into the world ahead of us. So hold your head high and be proud. You deserve it. Thank you.
members of academic honorary societies, leaders in student government and other campus activities, most valuable players and team captains in varsity athletics. To honor all of these students, I ask that every student in attendance here today whose name appears in this program, not only seniors, but students from other classes as well, to stand so that we may recognize you. Phi Kappa Phi is the nation's oldest and most selective interdisciplinary honor society. The Illinois Wesleyan University chapter was chartered in 1922, and it is the 31st chapter nationally. Phi Kappa Phi recognizes and celebrates the finest and scholastic achievements of students from every academic discipline represented at this institution. Invitations to membership in the society are extended to the top 7.5% of juniors and top 10% of seniors. Please turn to the relevant page of your program where you will find listed the members of the Illinois Wesleyan University chapter of the Honors of Society of Phi Kappa Phi. For those seniors graduating in May, we wish you well as you begin your next adventure. And for those of you who are juniors, keep up the excellent work and we look forward to witnessing your many accomplishments next year. Today we gather as a community to honor those individuals in our midst who have reached significant milestones in their careers or who have achieved excellence. In that spirit, I ask at this time that all members of the society president, be they student, faculty, staff, alumni, or guest, stand now and be recognized by a round of applause. academic year since 1932, the National Honor Society of Phi Kappa Phi has held a graduate fellowship comp competition. Only one student member from each chapter may be entered annually, a nominee we choose from a pool of applicants. The winners of the National Fellowship will be announced by June 1st. Our nominee this year is physics major Julia Savage. Julia has been accepted to graduate programs in physics at Northwestern, Pennsylvania State, and Arizona State. She will likely study at Northwestern in their unique engineering design innovation program, which trains students in a field that borders art and science. Please help me to congratulate Julia on the nomination and wish her luck in the national competition. heard that news along with you. <laughs> Founded in 1776, Phi Beta Kappa is America's oldest academic honor society and was the first to name itself by Greek letters and introduce the customary characteristics of subsequent honor societies, a seal, a Greek motto, in our case, Philosophia Biu Kubernetes, uh, or the love of learning is the guide of life. Um, an elaborate initiation ceremony, a secret oath, a secret handshake, <laughs> all of which will soon be revealed to this year's class of initiates. On Sunday evening, April 17th, they will be inducted into the Lambda of Illinois chapter, joining a society whose membership includes 17 US presidents, 136 Nobel laureates, 38 U.S. Supreme Court justices and one nominee who's in limbo, as well as members of the faculty, administration, staff, guests, and students here today. If you are a member of Phi Beta Kappa or will be initiated into the society on the 17th, please stand now and be ready. You may have seen flyers for this going around campus. This award, award is designated 
uh, is designed to foster and celebrate student research that engages, translates, and bridges academic disciplines and or crosses traditional academic boundaries. Any IWU senior or December 2015 graduate is eligible to apply for this award. Membership in Phi Beta Kappa is not required. And this year, thanks to the generosity of an anonymous donor, we have a $100 prize. So applicants will submit a research paper, a senior seminar paper, uh, an honors research paper, or a senior level independent research project, a work of art, composition, film, collection of poetry, or research that stems from experiential learning. The award-winning project and other excellent submissions will be published in the fourth volume of Crisscross. IWU Lambert Chapters Online Journal of Interdisciplinary Work. So the deadline for submissions is reading day, Wednesday, April 20th, 2015. So look at the flyer and check out the IWU Phi Beta Kappa website um, to see how to submit. <coughs> Phi Beta Kappa honors not only academic achievement, but the clear manifestation of three core values we deem central to our community. The value of liberal learning, the value of academic integrity and commitment to the social good, and the value of friendship. We look forward to welcoming a new group of students who demonstrate these qualities at the induction ceremony on the 17th. Thank you. Thank you.
Mads, Maya, and Elena, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, today, we acknowledge two faculty members who will be retiring this year. Uh, the first, Professor of Sociology, George M. Rundblad, joined the Illinois Wesleyan faculty in 1992. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees from Illinois State University and her PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana. Her areas of interest include the sociology of work and occupations, race, class, and gender, and women's studies. All of these interests are reflected in her research on how the care of the dead is transformed from unpaid work performed in the home by women into a lucrative new profession monopolized by men in her book, From Shrouding Woman to Lady Assistant, an analysis of occupational sex typing in the funeral industry. She's also co-editor of the book, Multiculturalism in the United States, Current Issues, Contemporary Voices. Dr. Rundblad has taught courses in race and ethnic relations, marriage and family, medical sociology, and class status and power, as well as an influential gateway on Disney. Please uh, join me in a round of applause in honor. Of Susan Swanland, who will retire in December and may, may in fact be uh, honored at this event again next year. But uh, Dr. Swanland is an alumna of Illinois, uh, Illinois Wesleyan University. She received her Master of Science in Nursing from Texas Women's University and her PhD in Nursing from St. Louis University. Before joining the Illinois Wesleyan faculty in 1995, Dr. Swanland taught at the Mennonite College of Nursing in Bloomington, where she received the Dr. Kathleen A. Hogan Teaching Excellence Award. Dr. Swanland served as a staff nurse at the uh, cardiothoracic intensive care unit at Barnes Hospital in St. Louis, also in the operating room and post anesthesia recovery room at Brokaw Hospital in Normal and at Baylor University Center in Dallas. Later, she was an operating room supervisor and then director of the Cataract Surgery Center in Dallas. She's published articles and, uh, and has lectured on topics related to geriatric and cardiovascular nursing. Uh, Dr. Swanland is a member of Sigma Theta Tau International and serves on the OSF St. Joseph Medical Center Community Board and the Illinois Heart and Lung Foundation Board. And last semester, Susan generously served as acting director of the School of Nursing. Uh, let's please give her a round of applause as well. as well as my recreational life. 
Last fall, I spoke briefly to the first year students about the value of not knowing all the answers. I spoke with enthusiasm on that subject about the amazement that I and my colleagues felt when we saw the first images from the New Horizons mission to Pluto last summer, and how, when we don't know the answers, we are open to learning new things. Today, I'd like to reflect on how I got to this career and this place by following a path that might seem to have been wandering. In her autobiography, the poet Louise Bogan wrote, the initial mystery that attends any journey is, how did the traveler reach his starting point in the first place? Not many astronomers come from my original part of the world, a small town in East Central Indiana, so that mystery is worth considering. For my fifth birthday in 1965, don't do the math, I'm 65, <laughs> my mother and some other parents took a few of us to Cincinnati, Ohio to be on the Uncle Al show. There it is. <laughs> there I am. <laughs> before there was Sesame Street, before there was Captain Kangaroo, there was Uncle Al. One of the features for birthday children was going down a tiny birthday slide. <laughs> Uncle Al met you at the bottom, and I discovered on the spot, asked you what you wanted to be when you grew up. I'd never thought about this at all. Can you believe it? Five years old, I never thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> Two boys went first, and the first said with great confidence that he wanted to be a fireman. The next said, a little less certain, that he wanted to be a fireman too. <laughs> well, Uncle Al said nice things to them, so I said, I want to be a fireman. <laughs> You know what came next. Oh, Linda, don't be silly. Everyone knows that girls can't be firemen. <laughs> now, I don't remember feeling traumatized, embarrassed, angry, which is good. Today, it wouldn't be pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so a few days later, among my presents, I found this. My little golden book about the sky. This is the original, and you can see from the 25 cent price. <laughs> No matter how small or tall you are, you can touch the sky. The sky begins at the ground. Now that really caught my attention. The idea that the sky wasn't just out there, but close to me intrigued me. I could start at the ground and just go up and up and up and be out there among all those neat things in the sky. I asked my mother, what do you call a person who looks at the sky? And she said, an astronomer. Well, that's what I'm going to be when I grow up. Well, I had very little idea of what firefighters did, and I knew even less about what astronomers did, or what the trail to get there would be like. So at some point, things had to get real. I had a fairly normal childhood and school experience, which means kind of boring for a talk like this, so there aren't any slides about it. But when I got to Indiana University, uh, the weakness of my very small high school science program quickly became obvious, and I quickly changed my major to English, and then to elementary education. Now, English literature and education are both passions of mine, and some of the classes I took during that time were actually my all-time favorites. But, when I took a survey astronomy class for non-majors as a junior, I fell in love with astronomy all over again. I managed to cram an astronomy major into four semesters. Now, taking second semester physics and third semester physics in the same semester is not a recommended <laughs> career path for <laughs> Somehow, though, this wandering, less direct path worked for me. I was fortunate to arrive at Cornell University for graduate school, just as Carl Sagan was becoming a household name and the first celebrity scientist in my life. His astronomy class for non-majors ballooned from an enrollment of 40 to 400. And for those of you unfamiliar with his work, Carl Sagan was the creator of the first Cosmos series, he remains the most original popularizer of science, in my opinion. I was a teaching assistant for Carl's class, and to my amazement, students started coming to my office hours, even students who weren't in my section. They seemed to feel that I had something to offer. One undergrad told my office mate, she doesn't make me cry like my TA did. <laughs> <laughs> we had no training, we didn't know. <laughs> I was fortunate to have an office around the corner from the youngest assistant professor, Joseph next to Carl here. Joe had been recruited by Carl fresh out of graduate school at Harvard. He was full of enthusiasm for what I realize now was a revolutionary idea, 
starting a laboratory research program to study meteorites and to compare observations made in the lab with telescopic observations of asteroids and comets. It had long been suspected and even assumed that meteorites come from the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. So little white dots there are the main belt asteroids. But science isn't satisfied with suspicions and assumptions. We need hard data. So for my thesis, I worked in Joe's lab, uh, observing the reflectance properties of meteorites that look like this. This is called a carbonaceous chondrite. And if you saw it in your driveway, you'd probably think that someone had dropped a charcoal briquette. But these particular meteorites are the oldest rocks in the solar system, dating back to its formation more than four and a half billion years ago. And as we found out, they were a perfect match for the majority of the asteroids in the outer part of the asteroid belt, more distant white dots we saw there. <coughs> Three years ago, Joe Verka received the highest honor our planetary sciences community can bestow. The citation read in part, as a planetary scientist, Viverka has defined the field of quantitative <coughs> study of small bodies in the solar system for a generation, a generation populated by his students and many associates. This photo was taken at a celebration of Joe's 60th birthday, right before I came to Illinois Wesleyan. That's him right behind me in the center there. This is a group I'm proud to have been a part of. As you know, graduate school is demanding work with long hours, in my case, lengthy problem sets and deadlines that to a student can seem arbitrary. During this time, as a diversion, a friend invited me to try hiking in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. It's only nine miles and 3,000 feet of climbing. You'll love it. <laughs> now, for a girl from the flat lands of Indiana, this was scary. But to my amazement, when I reached the top, I did love it. That was the view. The best description I've heard of the feeling you get at a, at a, when you get to a view like this is, it's like therapy, church, the gym, and a love affair, all at the same time. <laughs> I learned that there were 48, 4,000 foot mountains in New Hampshire, and then if you climb them all, you could get a scroll with your name on it, there's mine, and a patch that's supposed to go on your backpack. I've chosen to display mine in a rather unorthodox place. <laughs> right here. Yeah, faculty members take selfies at graduation, too. <laughs> Obviously, I climbed all the mountains for 20 years, doing many of the heights uh, alone. The sense of pride I took in this accomplishment was enormous, and you can tell it's still important to me today. My work at Cornell was satisfying and groundbreaking, but once I got into thesis research, I missed the teaching. Something was missing inside the lab, where to study how a rock reflects light, you have to turn off almost all the lights. So I wandered again, trying to fit those pieces together. It was as a postdoc and an instructor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that I began to find my true calling, observing asteroids in the sky, often accompanied by students. With my advisor, Professor Jim Elliott, I established a field camp during MIT's January term, similar to our May term. In this program, which MIT still continues, students go to Lowell Observatory in Arizona for three weeks to do research with either a staff member from Lowell or from MIT. This particular group discovered asteroids and comets, wrote new computer codes, and built instruments. Some of them went on to become astronomers, and some decided to become science writers, systems engineers, and investment bankers, and that's great too. It was here that I began developing the research program that would eventually bring me to Illinois Wesleyan. Today, instead of lab work, my observations are made using optical telescopes, usually from a mountaintop in Chile. I've got to show a few Chile slides here. Here's looking from the big telescope that we uh, will be using soon to some of the smaller telescopes. Those are the foothills of the Andes. This doesn't show so well with the light, but on a clear night, the Milky Way rises over the domes and it's just gorgeous. And even when we have cloudy nights, we have great sunsets. So, a lovely place to work. <laughs> when I began this project, my goal was to study the shapes and the spin rates of some special asteroids called the Jovian Trojan asteroids. And I still study them today. Uh, but, so the white dots are the main belt asteroids, the green dots on either side of Jupiter out there are the Jovian Trojans. So you can see that they're separated from the main belt quite a bit. Okay, it wouldn't be a Linda French asteroid talk without a potato. <laughs> 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 Well, why a potato? This is what an asteroid looks like when we're lucky enough to 
to see one up close when we send a spacecraft there. They're too small to see them most of the time. You can see it's a pretty good likeness. <laughs> and asteroids shine by reflecting light. Now, if the sun is out there and you're sitting on the Earth looking at the asteroid, it's going to reflect more light when you see this side than when you see it end on, and then it'll reflect more light and less light. So as it goes around once, we, that would be the day on the asteroid. So there would be two bright sides and two darker sides. So when we make a graph of the light brightness with time, there's what you get. Two peaks, that's this side, and two low points, that's this side end on. Cool? All right. <laughs> OK. So we think that the asteroids have collided with each other, and that those shapes have been altered along the way. Since those Trojan asteroids are isolated from the other asteroids, it seemed reasonable that they might have a different history from the main belt, and that might tell us something about the formation of the solar system. But there are other processes that can change asteroid spins. This sounds like science fiction, but it actually has been shown to work. Strange as it might seem, over a long period of time, sunlight itself can actually cause asteroids to spin faster or slower. I can't go into all the detail on this slide. This was the prettiest one I could find. But basically, sunlight comes in, warms up one side of the asteroid, as the asteroid turns, then it's warmer and it radiates out into space. This gives the asteroid a tiny push, which over a day, a month, a year, even a million years doesn't make much difference. But again, we're talking about billions of years here. And that can cause the asteroid to either spin faster or slower, depending on which way it's rotating. It can also cause its orbit to change, moving it further from the sun, or potentially of great interest to every person on Earth, closer to the sun, because that's why these things keep coming in and, and suddenly being discovered. So we need to study. Well, during the 90s, with a small child, I focused more on teaching than on observing research. I was on the faculty of Wheelock College in Boston, a tiny college whose mission is the preparation of elementary teachers and social workers. I worked with science educators, often team teaching, encouraging students to explore their own learning and developing new curriculum. I loved working with the future teachers, I still do, and I look back fondly on those times. But again, something was missing. It was the research, chasing asteroids, and asking questions of the universe and looking for new answers. The great Chilean poet Pablo Neruda wrote, you start dying slowly if you do not change your life when you are not satisfied with your job, or with your love, or with your surroundings. If you do not, do not risk what is safe for the uncertain, if you do not allow yourself, at least once in your lifetime, to run away from sensible advice. Now, the sensible thing for me to do as a tenured faculty member would have been to stay put. But I wasn't able to carve out that time to do research, to work with majors, to develop and teach advanced classes like observational astronomical techniques and astrophysics. And so I started looking at job ads, and here I am. It can be a challenging thing to get back on the research track once one has gotten off. And here's where the mountains come in. Without the determination and the tenacity I developed in logging those miles and thousands of feet of climbing, I don't think I'd be here at all. The ability to ignore sensible advice, in your terms, such as don't go hiking alone, that probably helped too. In many ways, I see my chasing mountains here on Earth. This is Maine's Mount Katahdin. That's my goal for this summer. And mountains in the sky. This is the comet that was studied by the European Space Agency in 2014. I see those two as aspects of the same quest. So at Illinois Wesleyan, with the help of both internal and external grants, I've been able to do more than I thought possible. My students and I have been making those regular trips to Lowell Observatory and to Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. And here are most of my students here, many of my students, Tracy Crane, John Oppegard and my meteor crater, Derek Roll, Daniel LaRocca, Chelsea Dowd, Bob Connor, and Jennifer Siegel. Can you see the Milky Way there behind us? That shot didn't just happen, folks. That, that, there were hours of the planning them. <laughs> John can tell you. We're seeing evidence that that light effect that I mentioned may have affected the rotation of many Trojan asteroids. This is work that had uh, was something that was not known before. It actually was thought couldn't have happened, but it seems to be there. So maybe we don't have all the answers yet. This is work I'll be continuing uh, in the future. 
here on campus. We've upgraded the Mark Evans Observatory. Uh, help from the administration, but the students did most of the heavy work, both literally and figuratively, in getting a new telescope and uh, a new CCD camera uh, that we can take electronic images and analyze them on computers. And the students have even carried out and published research on their own, right here from campus, in refereed scientific journals. Not all who wander are lost. No, indeed. Perhaps some people are blessed, if that's the correct term, with the ability to move from one career goal to another in a straight line. For whatever reason, that hasn't been my way. I've learned from listening to and working with great scientists, but I've also learned from discussing Newton's laws with a pre-service kindergarten teacher and from answering questions with Illinois Wesleyan students. <coughs> my life has been enriched by working at world-class observatories, but also by having star parties and eclipse watching parties on campus. We all need to recognize and cherish the things that nourish us. We need to honor those things by spending time on them, for in that way we honor ourselves. We need to share the things we love with others, and we need to allow others space to grow and pursue their own passions. I've done all that I wanted and more than I thought I could do, seems Beyonce. My <laughs> wish for each of us is to be able to say the same thing. Thank you.
This year's winner knows that Margaret Mead did not write Gone with the Wind. <laughs> this year's winner knows where Sinte Gleske University is. Yeya anajua kwamba himi kiswahili kama mimi alitamka kuwa usahihi, which I hope means, quote, she knows that this is Swahili if I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> With a bachelor's degree from Mount Holyoke College and a master's and PhD from the University of Florida, this year's winner of the Kemp Award winner is Professor Rebecca Garrett.